Great way to start the week. We're joined by Nathan Bell from Peters McGregor. He's joining us live from our Sydney CBD studio. Um, welcome to the program, Nathan. We are so focused on reporting season here in Australia, but there are a lot of reports still coming through when it comes to the U.S. and some pretty big companies as well. Tesla, Walmart, Home Depot. I mean, Walmart and Home Depot in particular, don't you think, will be so interesting to see the state of the U.S. consumer? Mm. Look, my feeling is at the moment is that the animal spirits may be slightly being unleashed. We've still got very strong employment in the US. We've still got very low interest rates. Uh, and what we, we actually have an investment in a home builder uh, called NVR. And there's some huge tailwinds blowing behind that business. Uh, a lot of people actually think when interest rates start to go up that people actually start to pull in their spending. Uh, but actually, we think it might be the case, and, and this has been borne out through history, is that people actually tend to want to lock in those low rates. So, uh, we're betting on the side that people will actually start to buy more homes, uh, given there's a somewhat of a shortage in the U.S. Certainly so. There's actually a shortage of labor even in the U.S. when it comes to the construction market. So do you play it using those American companies, Nathan? Or, I mean, do you pay any attention to the likes of James Hardy and Borel and some of the Australian listed companies that have exposure to that U.S. market? Yeah, we're purely international, uh, but obviously for uh, Australian investors, uh, that's certainly one place to look. Uh, the difference I would say is that the James Hardys of the world, uh, it's very well known of how, how good those businesses are and that's reflected in their valuations. Uh, if you look at MVR and, and the home builders generally in the US, they're not really priced for a massive increase in home building. So it's not just that we like the particulars of MVR and there are some peculiar things about that business that we think make it very safe. Uh, it's actually bought back 75% of its shares on issue over the last 20 years. So that, that's a good plan mm. B if we don't actually get the increase in home builds that we expect. Uh, but uh, again, it's just the, the valuation of MVR is much more attractive than a James Hardy. So we saw, I guess, the switch from active funds to passively managed funds continuing in 2016. Given the environment that we're in right now overseas, in the US in particular, do you expect that to continue in 2017? Yeah, I actually do. Uh, and, and the reason is, is I think people want to put money to work in the stock market because the returns elsewhere uh, you know, lousy, to say, to say the least. Uh, as long as interest rates remain low, then any sub, uh, anything outside equities um, tends to be very highly priced. But, uh, but in saying that, so is the share market, but at least it offers um, higher returns than what uh, some of the fixed interest markets do. Uh, and people have probably got enough invested in homes and housing uh, but the thing is, as long as the index stays strong uh, and as long as active managers uh, aren't sort of a shining light uh, in the sense that they're outperforming the index by a long way, which they haven't been over three and five year periods now, which is what most people look at, I think people are going to tend to favour uh, those sorts of passive funds. But I do think at some point uh, gravity will hit and you can't have extremely high valuations and fairly tepid economic growth. At some point you have to reconcile that. And when that happens, and I don't know when it happens, uh, that's when you'll start to see the active managers really outperform. So if you're looking for a contrarian play, it's almost uh, looking at active managers. OK, that's interesting. So how do you fundamentally view the American market? I mean, do you think that it is, uh, you know, the valuations are just running too hard for the actual economic fundamentals, which do look quite strong at this time, at least, um, you know, much improved from where we're coming from? Yeah, I think one interesting scenario that we may get, and just bear in mind this is all speculation, but we've actually got very high valuations in the US. For any company that has a familiar growth story or is easy to understand, uh, is well managed or a big name that people feel comfortable with, they are trading at very high multiples. And if you look at the, the median stock in the S&P 500, uh, we're essentially at record levels, which tells you that the future returns uh, for a broad index should be really, really low. So it's not something you should be looking at. Um, you need to be looking stock by stock. But again, I think that's at the moment uh, people aren't prepared to do that. And a lot of those really cheap stocks are actually pretty ugly and low quality. So I think an interesting scenario might be where the US economy actually does fairly well over the next four or five years, but maybe the stock market doesn't do that well because you're starting from such a high point of valuation. Uh, but so you don't necessarily see any one event um, really turning things for the US market necessarily is what you're saying. I mean, you don't see China, big slowdown there, as sort of an outlier that could really sort of throw a spanner in the works? You just think that it's the fact that valuations are already starting at such an elevated level? Look, I think there are lots of macro things to worry about uh, if that's what you focus on. Uh, we just try to go stock by stock. Uh, trying to predict the next big macro event and how to profit from it is very difficult. 
and there's really no one out there that can do that consistently. There's probably a couple of names who have done it over history, but for the average person, I think that's extremely difficult. That said, China's an example where we see big macro issues at some point because of the amount of debt in the system, yet we own two stocks there that we think over time are going to grow despite what happens in the, in the macro environment. We've hedged the currency in case there's a large devaluation, uh, but we own essentially the Amazon of China and the Google of China. And as you saw, uh, Google and Amazon did during the GFC, they continued to grow and have been wonderful companies. So uh, they're the sort of ideas we're trying to work on stocks that will do just fine uh, regardless of the economic conditions. Yeah, really echoing something that our earlier guest, George Baboris, was talking about in relation to Europe, that you still need to find those companies and there still will be those companies, even if you see Europe implode, that have you know, sustainable income and growth prospects. Um, so I'm wondering then, Nathan, I know that you look to um, Warren Buffett and his annual shareholder letter uh, with much interest. I know you actually traveled overseas to, to take part in that uh, event. I think it was last year. So what will you be sort of reading into? What are you looking for when we hear that update coming from Buffett and uh, Berkshire Hathaway? Uh, look, probably two or at least sort of one story that's the most interesting recently is some of the direct investments that he's made. Uh, Berkshire has put some money to work since Trump uh, has been taken in as president. Uh, people are a lot more bullish about uh, stocks, I, th I think, at the moment, um, given that Obama's out and it seems to be a more inflationary, higher interest rate uh, sort of less, uh, more freedom in the economy on banks, etc., to lend. Um, but some of the investments he's made uh, is uh, investment in Apple. Uh, and Buffett's famous for avoiding technology stocks. Uh, he's bought into airlines, uh, which he famously 20 or 30 years ago uh, yeah. basically gave an 1800 number and said to make sure he calls them if he decides to invest in an airline again. <laughs> uh, so these are some really different investments for Buffett, and I think it shows one that it's really hard to put a huge amount of money to work given the size of Berkshire. Uh, but two, I think it's just very hard to find attractive valuations. And with the airlines, you're seeing uh, much more consolidated sectors, so maybe they aren't the basket case uh, for capital returns as what they have been in the past. Really interesting. Well, perhaps we can do a debrief with you at some point, Nathan. Appreciate your time this morning, though. Have a great day. Thanks, Nadine.